All right. Um, it is my pleasure uh, and honor to introduce Professor uh, Jagannathan Sarangapani, um, or Professor Jag, who is the Rutledge Emerson Endowed Chair Professor at the Missouri University of Science and Technology, uh, previously called as University of Missouri at Rolla. Um, Professor Jag is a, a, a CEG alumnus from the 1986 batch, Electrical and Electronics Engineering, Triple E Department. And we have an exciting topic uh, for today on uh, introduction to robotics and autonomous systems. So without uh, delaying it further, uh, Professor Jag, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for uh, introduction here. So I'm hoping there will be more students here. Uh, so, but, but before I start, uh, there may be some interruption sometime in the middle, since I'm sitting at home, uh, there will be some delivery. So I just want to let you know that uh, there will be a doorbell ringing down the road. But uh, with that, uh, let me say today, I think uh, I wanted to introduce a little bit about robotics and uh, uh, autonomous systems. Uh, and, and in that part, I also want to talk about machine learning a little bit, and you will see that. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. If you want to see that, there are videos on my website. So please feel free to, to do this. So one of the things I want to show you, the products that we have built, which is a real commercial product. I want to run this uh, video on autonomous uh, mining trucks. This I was done in the early 90s. Mining executives and CEOs around the world. And almost in every case, they ask us, where are we with autonomous vehicles? So the reason this, this was built based on the work that we have been doing as part of Caterpillar. It's a product right now. So this was done in early 90s. And you can see there is no operator on there. With autonomous vehicles, you don't need those operators. So, so this, I'm going to stop here. Just for sake of time, this uh, was done early 90s and uh, when the GPS was uh, probably not heard of in a commercial world. So, so, so now I think you can see GPS widely used. So, so this truck essentially also we built on dozers, excavators and so forth before Tesla was, uh, was involved. And there are other commercial applications and it uses uh, neural network, machine learning, and, and so forth. So, so I just want to let you know before I move on. So, so in terms of the robotics, so all that technology came out from these uh, studies and uh, you know, fundamentals of uh, robot manipulator. So if you see a robot manipulator, you'll see something like this or this or that, and you see there is a revolute joint, or you can also have what we call prismatic. So I'm going to go a little fast because there's not a whole lot of time, you know, 15 minutes. And you can see this has two uh, prismatic joints and there is one revolute. And in this particular robot, everything is prismatic. So what I wanted to uh, show you was uh, when you model these systems, you model it like a mathematical equation, which we call this equation as a mass damper system. So you have the mass matrix, you have the acceleration, all this is done in the high school mathematics. So you have a centripetal or Coriolis forces, you have the friction, you have the gravity, and you have the disturbance and what we call applied torque. So it's like a human hand that you typically see that and you abbreviate it like this. So the goal in any of these robotics is to select this, what we call the torque inputs. So this is a very typical thing that we normally do. And how do we derive those dynamics? And uh, one of the ways you do is what we call Lagrangian-Euler equation. So D over DT, so simple calculus, where partial L over partial Q dot minus partial L over partial Q. Q is the joint angle, Q dot is the uh, angular velocity. And so L is what we call is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. So that's simple as that. And uh, a good example is like if you have a two link robot and you can see this is one link and this is the other. And we call this uh, at the end, we call is the end effector, a gripper. So in the Cartesian coordinates, this is X2, Y2. This is only a planar uh, link. So you can use a simple geometry. Q1 is the joint angle, Q2 is the other joint angle with respect to the first link, A1 and A2 are the length of the links and G is the gravity. So pretty much you can use simple calculus and say K1 kinetic energy of the link one is half M1 
omega square omega is r omega r is a1 times q1 dot and square of that so this is the kinetic energy here is the potential energy mgh and then x2 you know x2 is the coordinates here you can see a1 cos q1 plus a2 cos q1 plus q2 because this angle here is q1 and that is q2 so pretty much you use simple calculus and geometry and you can derive x2 dot y2 dot velocities and total kinetic energy total potential energy and then you can com compute what we call lagrangian k minus p so this is the expression once you get that then you basically take partial l over partial q1 dot d over dt of partial l partial q1 dot and so forth and from there you get the dynamics so once you get the dynamics you can write it in a matrix form look at that this is a two link you have two inputs so and then you can write it in this matrix form mass matrix acceleration coriolis forces gravity equal to the applied torque so this is how you basically derive the dynamics and then what we call is that you can write it in what we call a state space form some of you are not familiar uh, you know if you are taking a control systems class a second level class you may end up in doing that and here is the a vector of angles and velocities and and here is what we call as a dynamics and these uh, vectors here they are nonlinear because the mass matrix essentially is uh, nonlinear it has got all the products and also the cosine term and then you have this friction for uh, the the gravitational forces here coriolis forces these are nonlinear they are not linear forces so i think the issue with these robotics is how do you design something like a controller so that you can navigate and so forth so the first step uh, in in any of these examples is to define an error like i showed you the autonomous vehicle you have a path and and you want to stay on the path so you have a desired trajectory and you have the actual uh, joint angles and you define as the error and then you re rewrite the dynamics in this form where is the input u is basically an acceleration term and then inverse of the mass matrix and the coriolis forces so in this case essentially you are assuming uh, the mass matrix and the nonlinear forces are known typically they are not known but here you are assuming that and that's what you want to really apply to this robot okay so we call that as a computer torque because you are assuming you know everything and then you are applying it so there are a lot of different family of controllers they call that as a pd controller these are widely used pretty much in every industry and in a pd controller it's proportional and derivative so you will see that there is a proportional term and there is a derivative term in addition to these computer torque n is the forces like uh, joint uh, coriolis forces gravity m is the mass matrix so a pd computer torque has got the pd term and then also these uh, forces to cancel okay so you will see a block diagram like this in most typical uh, systems where you see that the nonlinear effects are here and here is the robot and then what we call is the outer tracking loop the outer tracking loop is basically a pd you see the desired information is coming in the actual measurements are going in and you compute the error and from the error you are computing the torque values using the kp and kv which is the pd controller you have the desired acceleration and then you have the m times that plus uh, n times uh, the input will give you the torque so this is how we normally do that and any industrial processes you will have what we call is a multiple loops and you can see there is one loop here there is the outer loop so here we use the sensors and you measure them and pretty much you have your controllers that go in there so this is a very typical industrial system and 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 basically a pid that's another controller that people use widely and pid means you have the proportional integral and derivative so you see that here is the acceleration term here is the velocity term okay derivative here is the position and here is the integral so epsilon dot equal to e that means you integrate that you integrate the error that becomes your integral term so this is very typical very typical and a classical controller that uh, widely used in industry basically uses a pid so this has the computer torque values the mass matrix coriolis 
here you don't have that. So this is typically what they use in the industry, okay? So now you can simulate it. First thing they do is to just simulate it and see whether it performs the way you want it. So, so what are we trying to design? We are trying to design a, a control scheme in this case, which is basically given by the cow. And then what you're trying to do is you want to have the robot to follow a path so that the gripper, which is the end effector, follows in the Cartesian coordinates. So this is basically what we call is a state space formulation. So this PID is in MATLAB, here is the code. And I don't know how many of you are familiar, but I just thought that you will have it and the slides and, and I have some MATLAB code here. There's also a bunch of MATLAB code. And you can see I've selected the mass of the first link is one kilogram, mass of the second is one kilogram, the length of the first link is one meter, second one is one meter, the gravity is 9.8 meters per second square, the gains for the position gains is 100, the velocity gain is 20, and, and these gains are selected based on what we call critical damping. And some of you, if you take the control systems class, you learn how to define a control system specification, overshoot, undershoot, and so forth. So I don't know how many students who are attending today have gone through those, but this is how you do it. And, and these are good courses. You will be surprised to do that. Here is the MATLAB code. And essentially you can simulate it and you will see that the error bouncing back and forth and eventually it's going to zero. So it goes to zero that shows that the, the actual joint angles are following the desired values. Basically the robot is doing what it's supposed to do. Here is the main program. You're starting with zero seconds and go up to 10 seconds. Here is the initial state vector. And you're using what we call ODE 23. This is the ordinary differential equation two, three, and some of you might have taken the numerical algebra, Runga-Kutta method, that's a Runga-Kutta two, three, and that's basically solving the ordinary differential equations. That's it. And this is what you do and you implement it embedded hardware. So one of the problems with the PD controller is that when there is a disturbance or when there is something dynamics that you don't know, then you will see the errors basically don't go to zero and therefore there will be large errors. So basically because of that, you really need to have some sort of a machine learning, okay? So if you have any questions, you are most welcome. Don't feel shy to ask me. So now I'm gonna move on to uh, what I'm calling as neural networks. So-, so Professor, uh, yeah. maybe if I could uh, um, yeah. uh, ask. So I think, uh, so the, the audience we have, uh, a mix of uh, computer science, electrical engineering, yeah. ECE, right. and uh, IST students, and most yeah. mean uh, uh, most uh, I think may have forgotten uh, their differential equations with uh, a predominant number being um, right. Right. in the. So I think uh, maybe a, a very uh, I mean uh, uh, this is all great detail uh, absolutely for uh, I mean control theory um, uh, folks and uh, some I mean even students who remember their physics it's it's great but maybe uh, at a very high level I, I want to be the um, the non expert uh, uh, question uh -huh. uh, and please correct me if I'm understanding this right so so far what you have uh, uh, explained is that a robot has um uh, I mean, an actuator or a control arm right, that right, uh, you want right. to move by using forces. And we are using, uh, because this is a physical system, we were trying to um, model, model them, them with uh, right. equations. And then these right. equations essentially come out to become matrices. Uh, right. The, and then and the differential then, equations, matrix differential, that's exactly right. Here is uh -huh. the matrix. And, and then, it's a second order differential equation. So Q double dot. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's basically a second order, F equal to MA. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah. then this controller that are the, um, mm -hmm. we're trying to compute these things using uh, uh, essentially programs that uh, like right. the first lecture, one of the professors right. uh, had uh, helped us with. Uh, and then it's uh, all of uh, uh, what you are showing is essentially in a product already in, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, oh, I mean, uh, in spite of all our neural networks and then great, the stories that we are hearing, you have showed us that it's from our early 90s, even. That is um, correct. And it's okay. very basic, very okay. basic that we learned those courses, like that's what I was saying. You're right. Uh -huh. uh, it's a, yeah, great. All the I physical think... systems are modeled as a differential equation. Simple. Perfect. Idea. 
perfect and that's what uh, i wanted to show but where is the neural network coming in is basically uh -huh. what i'm showing is when there is something unknown in the dynamics and typically the friction coefficient it changes right let's say you're walking on a sand you would have a different friction coefficient but when you are walking on a concrete uh, floor you would have a completely and so typically some of those values are not known and they can change with aging for instance and therefore some of these controllers for instance would have errors popping up and and that's where sometimes you may have to have some sort of a machine learning you see so so that's basically what i'm going to get into the neural networks a little bit and, and neural networks, I'm going to use that as a simple paradigm to show how the learning happens in the same example I'm going to give you. So some of you are probably familiar, neural networks started in 19th century, probably early 20th. And it's basically a lot of physicists, Helm, Mack, Pavlov, these guys, some of them are psychologists, some of them are physicists. They were interested how brain works. And 1940s, Mekla and Pitts, they were talking about using neural networks as a computer, basically. And, 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 and then after that, Hebb is a psychologist. He was looking at how to how humans do, how rats and uh, other animals do, how do they make decisions, okay? This is a big deal right now. And the 1950s, basically, it started by Rosenblatt and IBM, you know, how to basically look at uh, decisions using how to recognize patterns, digits and so forth in 1950s. Then people in Stanford started uh, looking at linear network. This, is, this, this network is currently used in airplanes to filter out noise, uh, you know, it's called the ADA line. And then after that, the MIT guys came up with AI. Basically they said, well, you know, neural networks still have issues. So I'm gonna come up with a term called AI. Okay, there are weaknesses. So that's when the AI came out in 1980s when we have the digital computers, then people started saying, well, we can implement these neural networks. And so late eighties, the first method using calculus, I'm gonna show you that hopefully today, it's called back propagation. This is to train the network. So this has happened. And so there are a lot of applications on neural networks. I'm not gonna go through all of them, aerospace, automotive, electronics, entertainment, financial, insurance, manufacturing, medical, oil and gas, robotics, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit, speech, telecommunications, transportation. But before you get into the neural networks, I just want to show you uh, the basics on neural networks. But if you compare it with brain, for instance, okay, the artificial neural networks and the brain, brain has a very highly densely connected network of 10 to the power of 11 elements, we have neurons. And a neuron has three components, what we call a dendrite, cell body, and an axon. So you can see that here is the cell body, here is the dendrite, and here is the axon. So basically the dendrite brings the signals to the cell body, cell body does all the uh, accumulation and summation. And then, and then it uh, has a threshold and it builds up pressure and uh, electrical signal keeps going up. So there's a fluid, a chemical versus the electrical signals. And then once it crosses the threshold, there is the electrical pulse that goes through the axon and goes to the next neuron. So it's, it's how the network works, okay? And artificial neural networks do not approach the complexity of the brain. And there are chips right now using artificial neural networks. And these neurons, if you look at the brain, they respond very, very slow, very slow, 10 to the power of minus three compared to this electrical circuits, which is 10 to the power of minus nine. So you can see the order of difference, but humans do, very complex computations, very fast. Whereas the artificial neural networks don't do all that. And the brain essentially has a massive a parallel computation. It's 10 to the power of 11 neurons at minimum. So basically each of us lose neurons over every day, but we still keep the memory actually. And whereas the uh, uh, connections, it has 10 to the power of four connections per neuron imagine that whereas the artificial neurons don't even have a comparison with it so this is a kind of a it's kind of a uh, comparison and and even now some of these chips are probably not even comparison to what we have in our brain i'm talking about not only just a human brain you look at a rat or even an ant for instance they do a lot of advanced decision making 
and, and so many different things, they can see fraction of a second, all that is being processed by the brain and we don't have such a computers even now, okay? So I just want to let you know. Now the question would come, one of the fundamental questions is, how are these networks learned? So there are three paradigms in machine learning. One is the supervised learning. Basically you have a target, you provide with the input and goal was to make sure the network basically generates these targets. It's called supervised learning. A reinforcement learning most humans do is like in a classroom environment is basically somebody teaches and, and in order to know how good the student's learning, we actually, as you saw, uh, just somebody mentioned that uh, earlier that, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're gonna grade the uh, homework or the exam and, and based on your grade, you know where you stand. It's called reinforcement learning. And I'm gonna show you a little bit, may not, maybe today or maybe next class. And the last one is unsupervised learning where basically you have all these patterns and you're giving to the network and the network is able to cluster them based on some properties, okay? So we're not, we're not going to cover that part. We're only going to cover these two, hopefully with the time. So the one of the methods that uh, when we talk about neural networks is what we call is back propagation. So before that, what I'm gonna show you is there's a lot of discussion went on and, and most of us know what an XR gate is. And if you know XR gate, you have zero, zero, the target is zero, zero, one input, then the target is one, one, zero, the target is one, and you have one, one, the target is zero. So I got to step out for a second. This is what I said. No problem. In the, in the brief uh, moment of pause, um, maybe if uh, the students have any, any questions or if, uh, anything to, uh, any feedback, please go ahead. They are uh, shy a bit, I guess. But please feel free okay. to ask any questions on the way. But here is an example, of a very fundamental. So you have an XR gate, and when I plot it, zero, zero is here, uh, you know, zero, one is here, and, and, and uh, one, zero is here, and the one, one. So basically, you see that you have these in, uh, inputs, and the network has to separate them. Now, why is this not linearly separable? Because you see these circles in between, and the squares are on this end. And this was the issue that in 1950s, people were looking at how do we classify that? And how do we separate these inputs? And you, know, you can see that you got to have two straight lines to, to separate them. So you have to have more than one layer of neurons. And I have given here a picture. And, and the question is, how do you get these weights, the two, two and whatever? And that's what we're gonna talk about. Now, there are, cases where you see that there are circles embedded with these filled ones, and you got to have a very nonlinear surface that has to separate those filled circles with the open circles. And this is what a human brain does in, in, in separating it out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you the next few slides, very basic, how we model these networks before I show you some applications. So a single layer network, you see that here is the, then right, you see that there is a threshold, there is a nonlinear activation function. These are the inputs that I showed you coming in from the brain and, and it's multiplied by these, what we call them as weights. And these are the weights that we need to find out. And these inputs get multiplied by the weights. And then if they exceed this threshold V naught, then you get an output, which it becomes one. So mathematically you write Y of T is sigma of summation j equal to one to n, if there are n inputs here, vj, vj are the weights that we have to find out times the xj, which is the inputs plus v naught, v naught is the threshold. So that's simple as that, a single layer network, okay? So once you have the single layer network, you can actually make it as a vector. Most of us are not very happy with these vectors, but that's how it is. And you can write it as y equal to sigma of this. So you, this becomes a matrix. And, uh, and then, so the activation functions that people are looking at, you know, for these, you know, which is basically this, this sigma is what we call activation function. You have what we call hard limits, symmetric hard limits, a linear function with a limit, a nonlinear, what we call a sigmoid and a symmetric sigmoid. And we also, people use what we call is a bell 
shape curve, which we call radial basis functions. So if you look at neural network literature, people use all kinds of stuff. And uh, later you'll see the deep learning, hopefully, you know, I, I can talk about it, which is very hard right now. So if it's a one layer network, more than one neuron, you can see that there's one, two, and so forth up to L. So you will become basically a matrix L equal to one, two, capital L. There are L neurons here. So you can see how you're building from one neuron to a layer of neurons. So it's, it's still be one layer network. And then it becomes a matrix. Here is the thresholds for each neuron. You can bring the thresholds as part of the weight matrix. Then you get a, a, a matrix V with a transpose and therefore the output of that network is sigma times V transpose X. And, and you can use MATLAB to simulate it. Here is a two layer of weights. One is the V is a one layer of weights. W is the second layer. And here are the outputs. And so YI equal to this. So as you increase the number of layers, we call them as a deep network. And we, how to train that, it becomes deep learning, okay? So again, it becomes mathematically a matrix. And you can see the output of the first layer becomes the input to the second layer. It gets multiplied by the weights. It has its own threshold and you get the output. So this is how brain has layers and layers of neurons. And so it, it does very complicated stuff. So here is the radial basis type uh, two dimensional uh, plot. And so I would rather have you look at it more closely. And you know what? In fact, you can actually predict behavior of human or what we call chaotic behavior of neural network. This equation is very simple. This equation is a very simple equation. Okay, and you can see X of K plus one is A times X of K. Here is a neural network in the feedback loop. Here is the input. I just picked some values and it's called, uh, you know, here is a MATLAB code. It, it, what is the shape looking like here? Can somebody tell me what this looks like? You can guess, most of us have seen this. What does this shape look like? This equation, when I simulated it using a simple MATLAB code, I see the shape of this. This is the behavior of that network. Can somebody tell me what you see this? What, what do you think this is, looks like? I, I have seen so many students there. There are 20, I, probably about 18 or 20 of them attending this class. At least one of them can answer this question. I see a print of silence. It's okay. So this looks like a starfish, okay? So a strange, you know, starfish attractor, but then if you, if you make a little bit, if you make a little uh, a change in some of these values, you see that that pattern gets completely changed. And as you keep changing it, you'll see that we call as a limit cycle. It forms a nice curve. And then you make, uh, you make a little bit change, then you see all kinds of odd shapes. So what I want to say here was a, a simple network behavior is so complicated because it's densely connected. So the brain has tons and tons of neurons and it has 10 to the power of four connections. So you can store tons of information. You can do lots of decision-making that you cannot do in a simple uh, computer actually. That's the main thing, okay? So anyway, one of the fundamental properties of a neural network is what we call a function approximation. So they can do a very nonlinear functions. You can approximate it. Here it's a two layer networks, two layer of weights, and you have some error. So the fundamental question somebody can ask is, how do you generate these weights? How does the brain does? Okay, of course, we don't know how brain is doing actually. How do we memorize things? How do we basically see something very quickly? How do we identify? So all these that I'm gonna show you are simply models that people think is what is happening and, and they can actually try to do and see and apply it. And as I said, these are applications that you, you, you will see it works pretty much. So here is a one layer network. 
and you can write it as a matrix form y equal to as uh, activation function multiplied by v transpose x v is the weights x is the input and x has one x1 x2 one is the threshold input x1 x2 and so forth so basically how do we try to find the weights basically what we use is what we call as a gradient descent so you're trying to descend from a hill and you are going to the valley and so the update law to get that is new value of the weights equal to the current value minus a step size partial energy function over the weights so how do we select the e energy function it's basically a quadratic function half l equal to one to capital l this is the number of neurons the output of the neuron el basically is the target value minus the actual output so this is basically a supervised learning so you're using the target value minus the actual output and you're defining as the error and the goal is to minimize this error and the way you minimize it is by taking the partial of e with respect to the weights and then you use the simple calculus to basically get uh, you know when you take the partial this with respect to e you get two times e and that's what you're the two and two get cancel out and you get el multiplied by you go inside this chain rule and then you get the partial uh, yl yl as the sigma and therefore partial sigma or the this particular coefficient and then you go through that and when you go through this and you take with respect to vlj you only get xj and that's what you get so the same thing you do the threshold and you get that expression and then you basically get the way you update the weights from there here is the general expression and so in a matrix calculus this is what you're going to get, okay? I'm not gonna explain the matrix calculus, we won't have any time otherwise. So, so what I'm trying to say is, this is basically what we call is a gradient descent approach. And this is how, uh, this is widely used method in deep learning, okay? And so this is called back propagation. And here I'm giving you the algorithm. Basically you get the input layer output, then you have the second layer, you define the error, which is the target minus the actual, here are the, uh, some additional terms. You're using it to tune the weights of both the layers. So this method is called back propagation or gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. It's widely used in deep learning. So we're gonna talk about that hopefully some other time. So now the question is, I'm gonna go back before I run out of this time here. How do we connect the neural networks and these two? Remember I talked about uh, the, the controlling this uh, robotics manipulator. And, and let's say that I don't know the dynamics. I don't know the mass matrix because the robot picks up an object. You don't know what is the mass matrix. So basically you're only defining an error, which is the desired trajectory minus the actual trajectory. And you are defining another variable we call the filter tracking error. And the goal was you're formulating the problem in terms of the dynamics I showed you this f of x is basically the dynamics, which is unknown. We don't know that because the mass matrix changes because the robot does something. Uh, the, the Coriolis forces change as, as a function of the trajectory. The friction coefficients change because if the robot, mobile robots moves on those terrain different and the gravitational forces. So what you're trying to do is you're designing a controller using a neural network. Okay, so where is the neural network coming in? So the neural network is basically, here is the uh, PD controller, here is the neural network. The F hat is the output of the neural network. We call that as a approximation based controller. And, and then you formulate the problem a little bit. Here is the controller structure. Here is the neural network. You have the outputs from the robot going through the network. The network is going to generate the F hat. All this part we have seen before, traditional PD controller and you're adding that and goes to that. So here, what we're going to do, we don't have a desired output. So we are going to use what we call online learning. That means there is no target values. So here is the torque value, which is the output of the network plus the classical PD controller. Look at that, how I'm updating the weights of the neural network. So it's a single layer neural network weights. Now, how are we generating those? That's completely a different uh, case. So I'm, I'm actually tracking that, uh, you know, here is the uh, actual trajectory. There are two links. So there are four graphs. One is the desired trajectory. The other one is the actual one. 
and you can see there are some errors. Here are the weights. And, and as I said, if I'm using a PD controller without neural network, this is with neural network. You look at that, you know, there are two graphs. After about three seconds, it learns the dynamics. And then you see that these graphs overlap. So that means that the error is zero. E1 and E2, the two errors are zero. But let's say somebody asked the question, what happens if I don't use a neural network? That means if I'm using a traditional industrial level controller, here is the performance of the system. So the robotic system, you can see how there's a large amount of error. Whereas if you see, if I'm using a neural network, it was learning. It's not a supervised learning. It's, we call that as online learning. We can't use supervised because there are no targets for F. So you can see how nicely uh, it uh, tracks very nicely. And whereas if I'm using the classical controller that uh, most of these robots use, you see a tremendous amount of error. That means that the robot doesn't follow the path. And so if you are using the robot to paint a, an automotive vehicle, you know, it has a lot of errors, okay? So here is the MATLAB code. So hopefully you can even um, use Can this. I interrupt yeah. uh, here, yeah. Professor Jack? Yeah. So uh, help me understand, uh, I'm not uh, a controls uh, expert. Right. So right. between a PD controller and uh, a neural network based controller, is it that uh, the neural network based controller was able to adapt to the environment? Why? That's so we correct. see that. We right. see that there is a difference. Can right, you give right, us an exactly. intuition of why right. that difference is? Right, right. So that's what I'm going to explain here a little bit with the reinforcement learning. So what you're formulating is the robot is sitting in an environment, it's trying to do something, and the agent in this case is the controller. So what the agent is doing is it's generating, it's sensing the environment basically through this information, through the sensors, and then it's making decisions. In, in this case, it's trying to control the robot. Okay, so that's an action. It's taking an action. So what's happening is since the neural network is part of this agent, it's able to, it's learning from the environment, okay, how it's performing, and that's given by the error, mm -hmm. okay? So if there's large error, the, the agent, which is the neural network controller, it's able to adapt, like what you just said, it's able to adapt. And the goal was to minimize the error. And I call this as an online learning because you're not training it, unlike the, what I showed you, what we call back propagation. So, so typically later you will see in big data and other examples I'm gonna show you, there you, are, you have to have large amount of data and then you basically train it. And the training process, what I just said, if you remember this, uh, when I presented the three paradigms of learning, I said supervised learning, and that's basically what I talked about. You can see here, the supervised learning, you provide the target and you, 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 you provide the input, and the goal is to minimize the error between the target and the input. But unfortunately for the robot example, you can do that because you don't know what the target is. So therefore you can't use it. So what we did, we are using what we call is the online learning. We are learning it uh, while we are sensing the data and that's what we are doing using the neural network. So that's why you remember I said online neural network control in this case. So, so what we are doing is by doing that, the neural network is able to compensate the error that you see here by the traditional PD controller so that you get the best result. And so it's adapting it in real time, you see? Thank you. And, and you can see how fast it's converging. It's converging in a fraction of about three seconds in this case, three seconds, how fast it is able to. So that's basically what's happening uh, between a traditional PD controller and- So a, sorry uh, to interrupt again. Yeah. Um, so in, the, in this picture here, um, when you say it adapts, and I see the two overlapping lines, the dark right. uh, and the light right. one, and about right. three seconds, they're, uh, they're one it's top learning. of each other. It's within the three seconds, yeah, it Correct. is learning. What is this dotted line? What, what is the dotted? So the dotted line is, so there are two lines, right? One is the desired trajectory that you uh -huh. want the robot joint angle to traverse, and the, the dotted line is the actual 
joint angle that the robot. So you're starting here, whereas you really need to be here. So initially there is an error, but you see that it catches up pretty quickly in, uh -huh. uh, within a few uh, fraction of a second. And after that, it tracks very well uh, the, act, the desired value. So that means that if I plot the error between the actual and the desired, it's pretty much close to zero. And, so and this, this is the other link. Yeah, there are two links. So, so there are four to... four total lines here. Right, then. right. And then right. one uh, each. So the two pairs of lines are essentially two different the outputs. The, 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 the desired outputs and the other two are the actual outputs of the of the of the controller. That's correct. Right. Okay. 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 Thank so you. So the goal was to minimize the error. So when you minimize the error, you know that the network has learned. The, the changes, what's going on and making the right decision in terms of applying the right amount of torque so that, so that the actual the angles are following the desired values. You see, in this case, one is a sine, other one is a cosine function. Okay, so it becomes a circle actually. If you look at that, when you, when you apply a sine and a cosine to the two link plan around, it, it basically draws a circle. You know, so that's how mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got so, it. so here is the how it's done by a traditional controller. And so you can see that because of the neural network, it's able to learn what was missing. And so you get the performance like here compared to what you are getting here. So that's why people are after these uh, machine learning based controllers. So let me quickly go through one more part, uh, if you don't mind. And there's only hardly three, four minutes. So I explained to you, we call that as a, I'm going to show oh. you the re reinforcement learning part of it. And so- We I'm have 14 minutes, you. Professor, don't- oh, yeah, I still have 14 minutes, okay. Yes. But I want to ask some questions. So maybe I, I'll take about, maybe about eight minutes or nine minutes, okay? So what I'm going to show you is, this is another re learning paradigm called reinforcement learning. Now, remember reinforcement learning, I said is a classroom environment. In a classroom environment, uh, unlike supervised learning, supervised learning is somebody is holding the hand of a child and he's drawing that letter A, B, you know, like most of us have done that. But online learning, you don't do that. But the reinforcement is basically, you don't even do that. You, you know, let's say I'm going through some uh, slides and then I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna have some homework. I want you to try the homework. And if your homework is good, you, you get a high score, then you know that you understood the material. So this is what we call a reinforcement. In fact, most uh, people, most animals learn by reinforcement. So basically you see that, uh, you know, you see a dog and you give a biscuit, for instance, the dog eats and then it knows that next time when you're walking close to the dog, it wags its tail. So that's basically what we call a reinforcement. So whenever it wags the tail and you give a biscuit next time, it knows that uh, whenever it, it has to, you know, and it wags its tail, you know, it, it knows that you're going to give a biscuit. So this is how this, uh, you know, action effect, you know, this was studied in psychology quite a bit. And, uh, and, and you know, and uh, when uh, they have studied what they call dog salivating, uh, when they were trying to connect it by ringing a bell, this is how they were showing that. And when they connect it, basically they can show that uh, uh, there is a, an action and there is a, uh, you know, something is happening there. So this reinforcement learning is a very popular paradigm. It's used in a lot of games, online games. So I'm gonna show you this was implemented on a mobile robot. And you can see that uh, there is a, what we call is a leader and there's a follower. So the leader actually goes in a circle and the follower has to avoid an obstacle and then it goes around and, and it follows their leader by maintaining certain distance and certain bearing angle. And this is done in a lab environment. So you can see it's going in a circle, but the, the follower doesn't know that the leader is going to go in a circle. It just measures the distance where it is. It's also following it. And you can see there are two graphs one is the desired and the actual, and you can see that error becoming close to zero. And so I plotted these graphs here and you can implement these networks. So each of these robots is using an 8051 processor. So it's an 8-bit processor. It's ba is basically, it has a 16 meg of memory and uh, it can actually processing, it's done through wireless. There's a wireless communication between the two robots. Now you see there is an obstacle being placed on the 
path of the robot and, and the robot basically there's another uh, leader comes in, this follower basically automatically makes decisions and it slows down, let the leader robot pass us through and then it makes it, see some of this getting into the AI side of it. You are not programming it. You're basically let the network try to make decisions. And I'm gonna show you some other examples down the road here. And you can see now it's, it's coming, it's trying to avoid the obstacle. Now you saw it located, there is a leader robot. It can't pass through, otherwise it's gonna hit it. So now it's going to see, it's gonna slow down. It's gonna change its uh, orientation, let the leader robot follow through. And then it tries to now avoid the obstacle. So there are some high level decisions that robot is making, which you can see as much, but if you observe this, you'll see that it's, it's doing it. Some of those decisions that it can make that humans do, okay? So I'm gonna stop this. And uh, you can also look at some other uh, things like uh, UAVs. You can fly these UAVs, and these UAVs are used for surveillance, you know, and you can, uh, you know, there are a lot of defense applications, uh, war applications, the surveillance, and these are being uh, uh, navigation and control of these are done by these uh, neural networks that I was showing you about. So you can see that there are different uh, types of networks, and if you are not careful, you can crash as well. So, so these are some of those videos that I was talking about. But uh, most important is before I end this lecture, I want to show you where this uh, heading up. So one of these games that you play, I'm going to show you a real AI part of it, which leads into what we call deep learning. Imagine that I want somebody to play a video game or a, a computer playing against a human. So in this case, you see this is a breakout game and you see this bar that's moving up and down. The goal of that is to have this ball never come down and it has to stay above. And the goal was to maximize the score. So this is what we do normally do. So this is a game and, and the game objective is to complete the game with the highest score, okay? So game is composed of multiple episodes. The way one episode work is you play the game and either you crash or the game is uh, ending, okay? This is what we normally do. So the input is the image of this. So you're taking images over time, constantly you're processing that data and that's coming from the environment. And that's going to the computer, okay? That's the neural network. And the network is making a decision either to move the bar left or right so that you're pushing the ball above. And the farther the ball goes and, and longer it stays, the score goes up. So the actions you can take are left or right in this game. There are other games like Space Invaders. You can actually go left, right, up and down. So the objective is to, to find a, a, a strategy, how to move this bar left and right so the ball never, you miss the ball and the ball stays well above, okay? So I'm gonna play the videos. So here what I'm doing is the, there is a method, the back propagation, we call the stochastic gradient descent. Remember I talked about that method doesn't do a good job. So one of the methods that we have developed, it's called uh, DQL. This method is, that's what people do research wise. So the input is the image of 84 by 84 pixel image, okay? Uh, and the image, there are a bunch of these images are going in. Sequence of images are being processed by what we call is a deep network. It has a convolutional layer. It has a feed forward layer. And the output is basically an action, which is the decision to how much to move the bar left or right. That's what we are doing. It's done by the agent. And the goal was to maximize the score. Okay. So, so I'm going to play you the, the, the stochastic gradient descent approach. And you can see that this is the traditional stochastic descent. So it's playing the game, it's moving the ball, the ball is coming back, but the idea was to keep the ball away and the longer it keeps away. So it's taking the score is moving very slowly. This is the approach that I was talking about by using gradient descent. Now, if I use the approach that I'm going to develop and eventually it found that it, found the, that it has to make a tunnel so the ball stays well above it. That's how you complete the game. I'm gonna show you the approach that we created 
We are not programming it. Look at that. Within a fraction of a second, it found out it has to make a tunnel, keep the ball, and that's it. The score keeps raising. So it looks like a very primitive behavior, but the network was able to learn. In, to, it learns that the only way you can maximize the score is by keeping the ball away. As long as it keeps the ball away, you see the score goes up so fast. Now, you're not programming the network to do that. It has learned by itself. So here is a simple game that you that network is able to generate without programming all this. So, so there's a lot of work going on by Facebook, by Google, for instance. And the goal was, can we learn, make the network learn just like human, basically in a very complex scenarios. So there are so many videos I have, I don't think I have any time. So this is where I'm gonna stop. So this is the future direction where basically they're talking about having uh, you know, autonomous vehicles, where you have a camera, which is viewing it, and, and basically that signals are coming in and, and uh, deep networks is able to make a decision. So a uh, Tesla car, whatever, so that, the agent is basically an AI agent. And you will be looking at so many complicated decisions, very complicated decisions. Here, you're not programming it anymore, okay? So with that, and there's a lot of opportunity for people, younger people that uh, were attending the class. Uh, there's a lot of job opportunities, tremendous uh, number of jobs right now, especially in the US and positive in Bangalore and other places. So uh, autonomous vehicles, transportation, uh, underwater vehicles, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, that's what is happening in a war scenario, you know, fighter jets, you know, any of these without any humans, okay? So deep learning, I'm gonna cover another part on uh, next week. We're gonna continue on this, but we're gonna look at some big data stuff because there's a lot of data these images generate. So how do we do that? What kinds of problems? I'm gonna go a little bit more deeper. Today I had a, a more uh, higher level, a little bit more on the AI and there is no programming. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking and I will have you ask questions. Thank you, um, Professor. Um, students, if you have any thoughts, please feel free to share. And KG, uh, same with you too. If you have any questions, feedback, please yeah, be free. And if you, exactly. If you, if you don't want to talk to me now, I'm just moving to my first slide. You're either most welcome to email me or, uh, or Dr. Karthik, whoever you think the coordinators, you're most welcome to email me. And my email address is here, sarangapatmst.edu. And there are plenty of videos on my website, lots and lots of videos. Many of them are in products. So whatever I just showing you, these are not mathematical equations, they have been in products. So like Facebook, uh, and as I said, so many of them being used right now. So, you know, like uh, tracking people in uh, airports, for instance, uh, face recognition, there are so many applications that uh, we have been looking at it and, and all of that uses this uh, reinforcement learning and so forth. So uh, next class, I'm gonna talk about supervised learning for big data because some of these images generate lots and lots of data. Any, any questions? That's okay, don't worry. Even a simple question is going to be difficult to answer. So if you don't want to answer today, you're most welcome to email me. Okay, at so least I, I, I want to see one student asking me a question. Go ahead. Actually, I'm a, a Sigana volunteer. Um, okay. Uh, uh, I just had some thoughts I want to share. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so it's it's very uh, um, um, you know compressed form of different things, right? Going through right. this whole. Sure. Uh, I just want to give a perspective to students that. Um, that's like a very multidisciplinary field with a uh, lot coming from mechanical or like in physics right. and then going into computer science. 
Right. And going into psychology, because when you're trying to solve problems, you're trying to understand how things work. And so it's very um, multidisciplinary and also at the same time, very uh, in depth of uh, things. So uh, I, I would say like we are talking 100 years of progress here. So right. don't get overwhelmed, uh, but it's very also interesting because the bigger um, uh, the the new things or innovations happening at the intersection of a lot of things because people have studied things very uh, separately, but uh, who thought like uh, someone could do something on mining trucks the same as what a facial recognition software would, would look like. So uh, right. I think uh, that perspective I want to add. Um, to, sure, yeah. I think I think you hit the nail on the head. Honestly. The why I put this math is it's important. You know, you can do without basic mathematics. So that's one of the things I want to show them. Okay. The second was it's not just simply mathematics because when I was studying undergraduate, I didn't know where I'm going to use some of these in which applications. And so that was another reason I was showing all these videos because you know I we do these simulations using MATLAB and then eventually we put it on an embedded system. And that's what I was showing the mobile robots in this, uh, these unmanned aerial vehicles and, and all, all the way to the games, for instance. Honestly, somebody is going to say, wow, you know, these games, you know, going from simple learning all the way to very complex uh, learning systems, right? That's one thing. The second thing is you said very clearly, it's a multidisciplinary. So you'll be surprised to see that you know, we started with a very simple uh, high school math, and then eventually we looked at the differential equations. So all this we study in our undergraduate, you're going to use it. You will never know when you're going to use it. You'll be surprised. I think that's something you have to realize that. And, and that perspective, I did not get it when I was doing my undergraduate, you see? So the reason I put that uh, autonomous truck was that was one of the products and it uses the simple math that we, we learned, okay? So I don't want to take much time, but uh, any other questions, uh, if anybody has it, please uh, feel free, don't feel shy. And uh, as I said, my next uh, week's topic, I'm going to look at it is, okay, it's going to generate lots and lots of data. Like what I just said, these games, Basically, they have some training. You see that for 400 million iterations. The question was, how do you minimize that? Tremendous amount of data. Tremendous amount of data coming from these images. And so the question would be is, you know, humans process this information very, very quickly. See, we recognize uh, faces fraction of a second. We don't take a while to basically a delay to recognize something. So the question is, how, what sort of methods, and we're going to talk, talk about deep learning more in depth and how to recognize that. And so I'm going to cover that with, from a big data perspective in the next class. It won't be this dense. I only have about uh, one third of my slides next class so that I want people to ask me questions, maybe more interaction. So any other final word, Karthik? Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Jack. I will, uh, if uh, after the uh, session is over, maybe I'll connect with you briefly on, on a phone call. And then uh, okay. uh, thank you students for joining. And then um, the recording and uh, uh, will be available on the same uh, Asan website. There is a link called materials where all the past lectures and slides are. So uh, uh, please uh, you check in a few days and uh, you will be able to see the same for this uh, lecture as well. And again, to, to remind everyone, maybe it's time to stop recording now, and then I'll, I'll uh, remind everyone. And before I go there, thank you, Professor, again. I'll stop recording now, and then I'll re-announce uh, the announcement I had made at the beginning of the lecture. Um, I'm stopping recording now. <laughs>